So thank you for joining the webinar. Our topic for tonight is balanced hormone health for improved energy, mood, and sleep. And if you're finding, you know, you're noticing changes as you've been getting older, uh, maybe changes with focus and concentration, uh, changes with appetite and cravings, uh, changes with your menstrual cycle and regularity of your menstrual cycle, and a number of other signs and symptoms that can come about due to hormones, then hopefully the information that's presented tonight can give you some idea of why things are happening and what kind of simple solutions can be implemented to help support your hormones throughout life. So just a few learning objectives for our time together. So hopefully uh, by the end, you will learn about the importance of hormones for health, the consequences of a hormonal imbalance. And we're gonna look specifically at the roles of the ovaries, adrenal glands and thyroid gland and how together they actually form a very important relationship called the oat axis and how imbalances of this oat axis can impact women's health. And um, of course, I'll, I'll provide some uh, advice uh, some guidance in terms of nutrients, herbs, lifestyle strategies, uh, dietary measures that can be used to support the ovaries and adrenals and the thyroid gland for improved energy, mood, sleep, and more. So let's start our discussion with um, about, you know, sort of female hormones and what they do and why they are important. So hormones in general, are very powerful chemical messengers produced by the endocrine glands. So uh, hormones that we are, you know, sort of um, aware of when it comes to women's health, we know that, of course, we want to be aware of estrogen levels, progesterone, testosterone, and other sex hormones. We also want to be aware of our adrenal hormones and our thyroid hormones as well. And these hormones are produced by endocrine glands. So there are a number of endocrine glands throughout the body, starting in the brain with the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Um, and then of course, the thyroid, adrenals, ovaries are common examples of endocrine glands, as are the pancreas um, and other um, endocrine glands that we might see throughout the body. So once these hormones are released into the bloodstream, they will travel to other parts of the body to really deliver uh, key messages that will help in terms of our growth and development, help us, you know, manage stress, help support our blood sugar levels and appetite, even our emotions, mood and sleep. And as you can imagine, um, if we're not producing enough of these hormones, if these hormones are not in balance, um, we're going to see issues coming about really at, um, at any age when we're dealing with, you know, the regulation of hormones. So you might be familiar with common endocrine connections. Often when we talk about uh, stress, for example, we talk about the HPA axis. This is the the connection between the hypothalamus pituitary gland and the adrenal glands. There are other connections such as, uh, you know, the connection between the hypothalamus uh, pituitary gland and thyroid gland. And of course the connection between the hypothalamus pituitary gland and the ovaries. Um, so these are pretty common connections that we talk about. Another connection that we don't talk about enough, but of course is very, very important, is the connections between the thyroid gland, the adrenal glands, and the ovaries. Um, and of course, these are key endocrine glands that are gonna produce very important hormones that are going to support our hormonal health and reproductive system throughout life. And together, um, these endocrine glands form uh, an important axis known as the ovarian adrenal thyroid axis or the oat axis. So here's a quote uh, from Dr. Michael Lamb. He's a medical doctor in the United States who was actually the first to coin the term 
oat access and describe its imbalances. So I'm just going to read this quote. And it says, if the adrenal glands are weak, there is often concurrent thyroid malfunction and menstrual cycle irregularity. Similarly, an underactive thyroid often makes adrenal fatigue worse off. Lastly, those who suffer from ovarian hormone imbalance symptoms such as estrogen dominance often have any pre-existing subclinical hypothyroidism exacerbated. So what does this all mean? Well, you know, we're definitely illustrating the importance of the connection between these three endocrine glands. And if there is ever an imbalance in one area, ultimately there may be imbalances in the other two areas. So as an example, you know, people who are under chronic stress, you know, stress definitely has a negative impact on our adrenal glands, causing different symptoms that we'll actually discuss in a little bit. Um, but that imbalance in the adrenal gland can actually impact the health of the thyroid gland and the ovaries as well. And of course, you know, other concerns with the thyroid can affect the adrenals and ovaries and so on. So we are actually going to, you know, really focus on each of these areas, uh, what can happen and uh, what can we do about it? So common conditions that women face and that are often influenced by the balance of the oat access can include stress. So our ability to cope with stress and manage stress, both acute and chronic stress situations, symptoms of low energy and fatigue, difficulty coping or feeling overwhelmed, sleep difficulties. So if you have problems falling asleep or staying asleep, that can definitely be influenced by the health of the oat access, hair loss, headaches and migraines, mood concerns such as anxiety and depression can, can come about here as well. And different um, health conditions such as estrogen dominance, which we'll talk about hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, infertility, PMS, concerns with weight, perimenopause and menopausal symptoms, heart disease and autoimmune disease. So some different signs and symptoms and conditions that can come about when the oat access is not in balance. So let's now look at each of these areas, starting with the ovaries. What can happen uh, with the ovaries and how can we support the ovaries? So females have two ovaries that are responsible for producing reproductive hormones, such as estrogen and progesterone. And also the ovaries are responsible for protecting and releasing eggs uh, that are needed for fertilization and conception and pregnancy. In general, there are three naturally occurring estrogens, the main one being estradiol, which is made uh, in the ovaries. And of course, as we enter perimenopause and menopause, the production of estrogen from the ovaries declines. Um, there are other types of estrogen that are made in the body, such as estriol and estrone. So we need estrogen. Estrogen is very important in terms of supporting the health of our, our brains, our bones, our heart, our mood, and even breast health, okay? And we know that as we get older and reach perimenopause and menopause, that decline in estrogen really does impact those different systems in the body. We see, you know, women are more prone to cognitive decline uh, as we get older increases in heart disease, uh, you know, decrease in bone density, all because of this loss of estrogen as we get older. So we do need estrogen. It's very, very important, but it's all about the balance. Okay. Um, so here we have, you know, this slide entitled estrogen, the good, the bad and the ugly. So what does that mean? So whether we are producing estrogen in our own bodies, and we'll, we'll also talk about, you know, sort of the estrogens that we are being exposed to in our environment through food and water sources and other products that we use on a daily basis. Estrogen does need to be broken down and it's broken down into different metabolites 
um, these metabolites will have a um, specific impact on the body. And then once metabolized, they should be uh, eliminated from the body as long as everything is working well. So uh, the main metabolites that are generally produced include 2-hydroxyestrone, 4-hydroxyestrone, and 16-alpha-hydroxyestrone, but they have different roles. So um, certain metabolites are protective and play a good role or are kind of labeled the good estrogen. So that includes the 2-hydroxyestrone. And then other estrogen metabolites are kind of the bad estrogens, uh, are not protective and may cause uh, proliferate, proliferation, which is a uh, growth of abnormal tissue cells. So that's when we see sort of our risk for different cancers uh, increasing. And the amount of each metabolite that we produce is really based on an individual's uh, body processes. So that can be, you know, related to genetic factors, um, what type of estrogens we are exposed to, and the ability of our liver and gut to metabolize estrogen appropriately and eliminate it. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So we are actually, unfortunately, living in a sea of estrogens. And what does this mean? So we are, you know, having our own estrogen being produced in the body, but it's definitely being influenced in terms of the estrogens that we are encountering in our environment. Um, women and the average woman is exposed to around 515 synthetic chemicals every day. And these synthetic chemicals are acting as xenoestrogens or synthetic estrogens, which are playing a role in terms of disrupting our estrogen balance. And this is not only impacting women, it's also impacting children and men. So definitely something to be aware of for all of us. So xenoestrogens mimic estrogen and can bind to estrogen receptors um, and unfortunately function as estrogen in the body. So where are we finding these xenoestrogens? As you can see here, um, plastic containers um, that we may, you know, you may store your food in, water bottles, styrofoam products, different conditional ho traditional household cleaners, dryer sheets, air fresheners have some of these you know, xenoestrogens, personal care products. So shampoos, lotions, perfumes, deodorants, makeup, some cosmetics and nail polish, different medications such as HRT and oral contraceptive pills. And unfortunately our water supply, our foods, especially those that are high in pesticides and our soil where a lot of our foods are grown. Um, so here you can see um, the Dirty Dozen list and the Clean 15 list that's put out every year by the Environmental Working Group. This is a really great list to have on hand uh, and be aware of. Of course, the Dirty Dozen are the top 12 foods that have the highest amount of pesticides. Pesticides, again, acting as xenoestrogens. So we definitely want to look at ways in terms of, you know, purchasing these foods in organic form. Um, and then the Clean 15 are the foods that have the least amount of pesticides. And of course, we can, um, you know, kind of get away with buying them as regular produce. Okay, so very important in terms of when we're looking to reduce our exposure to these xenoestrogens that we, you know, take a look at some of the personal care products that we are using, our household cleaners, uh, our cosmetics, and of, of course, the type of water and, and foods that we are consuming each day. So our exposure to these xenoestrogens and forever chemicals are definitely influencing our estrogen production the metabolism of our estrogens and the overall balance. And this is leading to a number of health concerns. So we basically, again, have this imbalance of estrogen and progesterone taking place, creating a condition known as estrogen dominance. So again, there's this imbalance in terms of the protective or good estrogens that we have compared to the bad estrogens and 
again, we also want to look at, you know, the other hormones such as progesterone and testosterone as well. So there's this exposure, of course, taking place in terms of the imbalance of the estrogens. And we also want to consider the health of our liver and gut. So the liver is, you know, the primary organ that's involved in metabolizing these chemicals and metabolizing our estrogens um, and our gut. So there's something called the estrobolome, which is actually the intestinal microbiome that is involved in estrogen metabolism and elimination. Um, so lots of concerns with gut health these days. And of course, that will impact our estrogen balance as well. We'll talk about again in more detail about that in a bit. But what can we see happen in cases of estrogen dominance? So, you know, heavy or painful periods, hormonal acne, PMS, hair loss, breast tenderness, slow metabolism and weight gain, brain fog, low libido mood swings, concerns with thyroid dysfunction. Don't forget that, you know, connection between the ovaries and the thyroid and the adrenals um, and concerns such as endometriosis, uterine fibroids, e even infertility, okay, can play a role here. Can you get your estrogen uh, metabolites tested? Yes, you can definitely get your estrogen levels tested. And there's a variety of tests available. Uh, you know, urine tests are very good at, you know, examining estrogen metabolites, we can also get our hormones tested through, you know, saliva and blood as well. Men are also facing concerns of estrogen dominance. So what are they seeing in terms of their own health? So definitely as men get older, there is a decline in testosterone that can take place and an increase of estrogen. Um, and they will, you know, sort of deal with concerns such as male pattern baldness, uh, male uh, feminization. So oftentimes men may present with what we call male boobs, uh, impotency, weight gain, infertility, low libido and brain fog. So definitely concern for men as well. So what can we do when it comes to sort of helping the body deal with this excess estrogen and this imbalance that's taking place? Well, definitely we want to look at supporting the liver and the gut. Okay, so more than 50% of estrogen metabolism, as I mentioned, takes place in the liver via our phase one and phase two detoxification pathways. So a few things that you can, you know, sort of, you know, easily incorporate into your daily routine. So when you wake up in the morning, you know, start your day with a cup of warm water with lemon. Lemon is very good in terms of stimulating the liver and its detoxification pathways moving your body. So physical activity, I know many of us sort of sit for long periods of time, unfortunately, because of work. Um, or maybe just don't have the motivation to get into a physical um, activity routine, but definitely moving the body, uh, promoting lymphatic flow uh, with dry skin brushing before a shower a few times per week and practicing hydrotherapy. So this could be as simple as when you're in the shower, um, you know, doing three minutes of warm water, switching to a minute of cool water and going back and forth three times. This is very good in terms of improving blood flow, improving lymphatic flow and improving elimination. Avoiding harmful chemicals and plastics. So, you know, I talked about some of those sources of xenoestrogens um, that um, we encounter on a daily basis. So, where you can choose organic foods, especially those dirty dozen foods, change your personal care products and home cleaning products that are free of fragrances and other chemicals, avoid plastic water bottles and containers, including superfoods. Um, so these are ones uh, specifically cruciferous vegetables. So Common examples are broccoli, kale, cabbage, other foods such as apples and beets and artichokes. These are all really great in terms of supporting the liver and supporting estrogen metabolism. Um, so looking at consuming about two to four cups per day of these particular foods in total. 
I'm saying yes to some chocolate. So uh, dark chocolate, especially dark chocolate. Um, so dark chocolate is high in antioxidants, uh, is a source of key nutrients such as magnesium, iron, zinc, which we need for hormonal health. Um, dark chocolate also helps in terms of supporting our mood and neurotransmitters such as serotonin and dopamine. And also plays a key role in supporting the liver. So here when I say, you know, say yes to some chocolate, one or two uh, squares of dark chocolate per day is sort of the recommendation. And looking at specific nutrients and herbs that will support your liver and estrogen metabolism. So just one product that you can take a look at. There are many available uh, with the intention of helping to promote liver detoxification and healthy estrogen metabolism. But here we have EstroSense from the Women's Sense line. Uh, it contains a, or provides a variety of ingredients such as calcium D-glucrate, indole 3 carbonyl green tea, turmeric, rosemary, lycopene, sulforaphane, and mix milk thistle seed extract. And these work synergistically together to help promote, um, you know, the production of more of those good estrogen metabolites, reduce the production of those bad estrogen metabolites, they also play a role in terms of supporting the liver detoxification pathways, also helping to reduce inflammation and provide antioxidant support. So this product is geared towards promoting healthy estrogen balance, reducing the symptoms of estrogen dominance, helping with heavy and irregular periods, uh, helping reduce PMS and hormonal acne, and also helping to promote healthy breast tissue. The label recommendation is three capsules per day once per, uh, three capsules per day with food, um, or as recommended by your healthcare provider, and definitely using for a minimum of three weeks to see beneficial effects. So uh, these ingredients uh, found in this product can be used for long term. Again, we are always encountering right some of these synthetic estrogens, and uh, we are always wanting to look at ways to support the liver. So this could potentially be a product just depending on the in individual that could be used on a long term basis. It can also play a role in terms of helping teenagers as they go through puberty. So not necessarily taking the three capsules per day, uh, possibly a lower dose. And it can also be used by men um, to help support um, estrogen levels and promote uh, estrogen metabolism. Uh, what's great about EstroSense is that there is a recent trial that was published in 2022 um, and very exciting. It showed um, that it was helpful in terms of, again, promoting those good estrogen metabolism and reducing metabolites and reducing those bad estrogen metabolites. So in this study, they looked at 148 premenopausal women this was a randomized double blind crossover multi center placebo controlled study. So, what does that mean? So, basically, you know, um, one group of the women took the estrus sense at the three capsules per day for 12 weeks, and then the other group took the placebo. And then at the end of the 12 weeks, they actually uh, switched. Uh, where the placebo group then took the estrosense and the estrosense group took the placebo. Um, and after that period of time, what they found was that there were higher amounts of the urinary 2 hydroxyestrone compared to the 16 alpha hydroxyestrone. And this again is a, a really important biomarker to assess breast cancer risk. And with a higher uh, 2 hydroxy, Estrone, uh, then there was a lower risk for developing breast cancer. Some really interesting research in this area. Um, so definitely look at, um, you know, the role of some of the, these ingredients when it comes to estrogen dominance. It's also important to support the gut. So again, I mentioned the estrobolome. This is a collection of microbes and their DNA that are helpful and really responsible in terms of metabolizing and excreting estrogen metabolites. So we want a healthy gut um, in order to do that. If not, we will have high levels of a specific enzyme called beta-glucuronidase. This will actually um, put estrogen back to its active form. And when it's back in its active form, it will actually be reabsorbed and not eliminated. So 
We don't want that happening. We don't want it reabsorbed. Uh, of course, when it gets reabsorbed, it will bind to the estrogen receptors again and, you know, continue creating that imbalance of high estrogen to progesterone. So we can support the estrobolum with prebiotics. So these are key uh, foods that provide a food source for our good bacteria in the gut. Uh, so great examples, you know, garlic, onions, apples, many more, and probiotics. So looking at the consumption of different fermented foods or looking at specifically at taking a probiotic supplement. So let's now move on to the role of the adrenal glands as part of this oat access. So we've done the O with the ovaries, and now we're going to do the A with the adrenal glands. So what are the adrenal glands? So these are the hat-shaped glands that sit above the kidneys. So we have two. Uh, they are often called our stress glands. They are responsible for secreting our stress hormones, um, such as cortisol, when we encounter acute and acute stressors, and when we are dealing with chronic stress. So they are responsible for helping the body deal with stress. When we encounter stress, we, you know, kind of go through three different stages. So we have our alarm stage. So this is our first encounter with a stress. Um, this is when, you know, we may experience that fight or flight response. Our heart rate increases, our breathing increases. Um, you know, we really just get in a mode to fight that stressor off. What we definitely see is that it's really rare for, you know, stress to be uh, short term. We're definitely dealing with a lot of long term stress these days. And so when the stressor continues, uh, we then go into the resistance stage. Um, and here is a really, really important time to support the body well, when it's dealing with this stress, because if we don't, we're going to encounter a, a number of concerns, which we'll look at in the next slide. And then the last stage is the exhaustion stage, which you can imagine uh, from the word exhaustion, we, you know, definitely um, sort of, you know, tank in that stage. So, um, but we'll take a look at the next two stages in the next few slides. But we do know that constant stress really, um, really puts a toll on the adrenal glands. Uh, it can lead to what's called adrenal fatigue. And 90% uh, of all illness is actually stress related. So a really important area for us to uh, pay attention to when we're looking at supporting our overall health and wellness. So the resistance stage, that second stage of stress, when it's not being, um, you know, handled properly, and we're not supporting the body appropriately, uh, we can then go into um, what's called adrenal fatigue. So what does this mean? Um, so we start to feel very overwhelmed, um, unable to cope with the stress that's at hand, and even just our overall daily tasks that we need to accomplish. We will see sleep disturbances. So this can be either difficulty falling asleep and or staying asleep during the night. And of course, with that, we're gonna experience fatigue and low energy during the day. There are cravings, as you can imagine, uh, for foods that we think are going to give us a boost, um, such as salt, sugar, coffee. Um, and they may give us that, you know, initial boost, but then, you know, we'll definitely see uh, sort of a drop in our energy levels, you know, soon after taking them. Dizziness, headaches, uh, changes in our mood. So being more irritable, anxious, sad. Uh, we'll notice concerns in terms of cold hands or feet, low back pain, um, you know, weight gain taking place, especially around the belly, and of course, hormonal imbalances. So you may start to see changes in uh, your menstrual cycle, uh, maybe it was regular, and now, you know, it could be a shorter cycle or longer cycle, you may even see more sort of PMS uh, type concerns coming up as well. But this is, again, a really important stage to really make sure that you're supporting your body during stress. But if you are not, uh, unfortunately, then you can go into this exhaustion stage. So when it's, you know, 
or we're not ma managing properly, not being treated and supported properly, we go into this exhausted stage. So you can see this adrenal function graph here, um, measuring cortisol levels, and you can get this done. Um, there's different tests that can look at cortisol levels. Um, and so typically you can get a four point cortisol test done where you're looking at your cortisol levels sort of first thing in the morning when you wake up uh, around lunchtime later in the day and then before bed. So this is an example of the results of a 57 year old woman who was having chronic sleep issues. And so you can see normally cortisol is high in the morning. Um, and then, you know, you can see from the green sort of uh, shaded area here, that's sort of the ideal pattern. Uh, but this reading is definitely very low um, and cortisol levels have definitely declined. And here we are just no longer able to fight the stress. We are at risk of developing stress related health conditions. This can be, you know, initially saw changes in mood, but here we may encounter, you know, anxiety. Uh, anxiety disorders, depression, concerns with memory and increased risk of heart disease. So we're, you know, definitely seeing high blood pressure taking place, um, high heart rate, uh, immune systems run down. So we may see ourselves getting more colds and having a harder time getting over those colds. Definitely will take a longer period of time to get over a sore throat, cough, etc. cetera. Uh, weight gain again, fertility concerns and digestive disturbances. So how do you know how your adrenals are functioning? So as I mentioned, you can definitely get your cortisol levels tested, you know, working with your naturopathic doctor, there may be medical doctors who also do this testing. So you can speak to your medical doctor as well. A uh, nice little test to kind of see, uh, it, you know, where your <laughs> adrenals are at and how you are, you know, sort of adapting to stress. Uh, you can head over to women's says womensense.com slash stress test. Um, and there's a really nice test here where you can rate different uh, symptoms uh, and it will tally it up for you. And depending on your score, you can find out if your you know adrenals are in good shape or if you really need to pen, pay attention to your adrenal glands a little bit more. Um, to avoid any long-term adrenal exhaustion from taking place. So that's a nice test to kind of give you a, a little uh, look in terms of what your adrenal status is. But what can we do to restore the adrenal glands? So if you've heard me speak before, you know, you know, I really hold foundational health <laughs> um, a top priority. So this definitely includes eating well. Um, so whole food nutrition, you know, making sure you're getting good quality protein and sufficient protein throughout the day, lots of fiber, we definitely don't eat enough fiber, fiber, very important in terms of supporting our appetite, but also supporting our hormonal levels, eating the rainbow. So making sure you have a wide variety of fruits and vegetables throughout the day, eating consistently throughout the day. So this may vary, uh, for individuals, some people like to have the classic, you know, a breakfast, lunch, dinner, other people uh, like to follow intermittent fasting, they find that that works well for them and their hormones. And that's totally fine as well. If you're not familiar with intermittent fasting, then definitely speak to um, your naturopathic doctor or other healthcare provider to support you in that. Of course, decreasing those stimulants um, that you think are giving you that boost, but it's really an artificial boost. So decreasing caffeine, alcohol intake and refined carbohydrates, um, including sugar, engaging in regular physical activity. So oftentimes when we are dealing with uh, adrenal concerns, we may not feel like we have the energy to engage in a, a rigorous um, exercise uh, routine. Um, so definitely simple walking, maybe if you like swimming, stretching, um, balancing exercises, these are all really important and can be very supportive. Incorporating relaxation exercising, so exercises, so breathing, mindfulness, all important. 
Um, this next point, understanding how perception plays a role. So this is very, um, very, very key when it comes to stress management, because oftentimes how we look at a situation uh, can really influence how we are dealing with it. So really take a step back, um, maybe journal, uh, talk to a friend in terms of how you are seeing a situation and how that's, you know, sort of influencing how you're dealing with some of the stressors in your life. Getting a good night's sleep. I know sometimes that's easier said than done. So lots of important um, factors here, you know, making sure you have a, a good bedtime routine, um, sleeping in a dark room, cool temperature room, minimal noise disruption. Um, so lots of important uh, key factors there. And when it comes to the adrenal glands, there's some really important nutrients uh, that the adrenals need to function uh, properly. So our B vitamins, very, very important. Vitamin D3, vitamin C, uh, and magnesium, of course. We know that there is a very important relationship between magnesium and stress, um, where you know, chronic stress can actually deplete our magnesium levels and low magnesium levels can actually impact how we are dealing with stress. So magnesium is very, very important. And probiotics, we know that uh, the gut um, is connected to the brain, the brut, the, <laughs> the uh, gut, sorry, uh, is connected to our HPA access as well. And, um, we want to make sure we have good bacteria in terms of supporting and overcoming any concerns of dysbiosis and leaky gut to support overall health. And adaptogenic herbal support. So adaptogens are herbs that help the body deal with stress. They help the body, you know, overcome the mental and physical impact that stress has um, on our health. So this particular product, and again, there's many products that are geared towards supporting the adrenal glands, but we'll look at this one. So the Adrena Sense product from Women's Sense provides five adaptogenic herbs, including rhodiola, suma, Siberian ginseng, schizandra, and ashwagandha. So these will work synergistically together to help support the adrenal glands to help reduce the impact that cortisol has on the body. They will help in terms of, you know, supporting immune system health, providing antioxidant support and reducing inflammation. And will play a role, of course, in supporting our energy levels and our mood. So lots of great uh, benefits with some of these botanicals as well. Recommendation is to take one capsule two times per day with food, preferably early part of the day. So breakfast and lunch, um, generally not taken later in the day in case it does impact your energy levels and, you know, sort of gets you energized in the evening. We don't want that happening. So this is any adrenal type product is best taken um, first part of the day. Okay. And the last endocrine gland that we'll take a look at is the thyroid, okay? So another important area when it comes to overall health. So studies do show that about one in 10 Canadians suffer from a thyroid condition. There are a number of thyroid conditions um, that can take place. We're gonna focus a little bit more on hypothyroidism, uh, so low functioning thyroid. Um, and of the Canadians that who are, you know, suffering from a thyroid condition, about 50% are undiagnosed. We know that thyroid, uh, thyroid hormones that the thyroid produces are very important. They act as sort of the gas pedal for the body. Uh, they're critical for overall energy support, a healthy metabolism and helping us manage weight. So typically we do get our thyroids assessed um, as part of regular blood work. Um, oftentimes um, what I generally see is, you know, definitely TSH being tested, maybe T4 under, you know, some circumstances, but uh, definitely TSH is, um, is generally tested and TSH is produced in the brain. 
And um, it's produced in response to our other thyroid hormones, such as T4 and T3, which are produced specifically by the thyroid gland. So it works on a feedback system. If we have enough T4, T3, then, you know, there's no signal indicating for the, you know, TSH to be continuously produced. But if we do have low T4, T3, then signal is sent to the brain to produce TSH to signal the thyroid to produce more um, T4 and T3. Um, so typically, again, TSH is tested. Um, now, one of the concerns with TSH is that, you know, the lab range for TSH, as you might have seen on your own blood results, is quite um, broad. Um, so, and if you fall in that range, then you're often told that your thyroid is normal, but you may still be presenting with some signs and symptoms related to low thyroid. So we want to, you know, definitely Take a look again at that TSH value. It should ideally been, be in a one to two uh, range. And here it's, uh, you know, one to 1 1.5. Uh, but one to two is usually pretty good. Um, and then higher levels should really be paid attention to a little bit more. There are other thyroid tests to take a look at. So T4, T3, reverse T3, and of course our thyroid antibodies. So a full thyroid panel can be done with a naturopathic doctor. Um, you know, doing that full thyroid panel will be, you know, very helpful in terms of getting a better picture uh, of what's going on with the thyroid gland. And I think we can, you know, definitely um, diagnose some of those cases that might be missed. Um, okay, so the thyroid gland produces T4. T4 is converted to T3. There is more T4, but T3 is actually your more active thyroid hormone. When individuals are given Synthroid to support the thyroid gland, this is only T4. Uh, so um, Synthroid is quite common and can definitely be used, but we just want to support uh, the conversion of T4 to T3 when an individual is using uh, Synthroid. Um, and also keep in mind that there actually is a connection, again, we kind of talked about this before, but there really is a connection between the health of the adrenal glands and the thyroid glands. So it's been found that about 80% of women with adrenal exhaustion also suffer from a low thyroid. Um, we know that the stress hormone cortisol can actually inactivate T3, our active thyroid hormone. So, and that can play a role in overall thyroid health. So again, really understanding that connection between the adrenals and the thyroid gland. And again, don't just focus on the thyroid gland. If you have a thyroid concern, you definitely want to again, pay attention to the health of your adrenals and the health of your ovaries. So here are some um, symptoms and complications associated with low thyroid. So low energy, a weight gain and difficulty losing weight, cold intolerance, hair loss, dry skin, constipation, depression, and infertility, among other concerns. So what can we do to support thyroid health? Um, so first off, always make sure that you're supporting the adrenal glands. That goes back to, you know, our foundational health, making sure you have a whole foods diet, engaging in physical activity, managing stress appropriately. And then the thyroid needs key nutrients um, and foods, and you need to avoid certain things in order to support, support thyroid health. So iodine is one nutrient that is needed for thyroid hormone production. So looking at consuming um, foods that are rich in iodine. So kelp, nori, different sea vegetables. Iron is actually, it's not listed here, but iron is also very important when it comes to thyroid hormone production. And getting your iron levels tested is key because if you are iron deficient, that can actually impact your ability to produce thyroid hormone. So definitely look at um, iron levels. That's really important. Avoiding GMO soy, and I know there are um, some people that suggest avoiding soy altogether, 
Um, so soy has been blocked, uh, shown to block the activity of a specific enzyme um, for thyroid hormone production and has been linked to autoimmune thyroiditis. Um, this is an, the next point, limiting raw goitrogens. So goitrogens are one or specific foods that may cause, um, you know, enlargement of the thyroid gland and impact thyroid hormone production. Um, so there is kind of old advice in terms of not to eat foods such as broccoli, kale, cabbage, cauliflower, turnips in raw forms. Um, there's not a lot of supportive research for that. So um, generally, you know, I sort of suggest just limit um, the consumption of these foods in their raw form, but you can definitely have them in a, you know, steamed or baked form. Healthy fats, so definitely, you know, taking a look at, at the importance of our omega-3 fatty acids because they do have anti-inflammatory properties. They are also very important in terms of supporting cholesterol levels, which tend to be high um, in, th in thyroid conditions um, and are important for producing hormones as well. So lots of healthy fats, really key. Reducing consumption of dairy and gluten in your diet. So oftentimes, you know, any food sensitivities that we have can impact thyroid function. Um, you know, the production of antibodies to gluten, for example, can also um, impact the thyroid gland. So removing these two um, components is very important. And then avoiding different toxins. So heavy metals, Fluoride um, or examples, bromine um, may impact or influence our thyroid receptors and impact our ability to produce thyroid hormones. So some key tips there. And then there are different nutrients and herbs that help to support thyroid health. So here we have an example of one product, Thyrosense from the Women's Sense line. So this product provides a combination of L-tyrosine, ashwagandha, Google, um, vitamin B5, and some uh, minerals such as iodine, manganese, and copper, which are involved in thyroid hormone production and conversion. Um, so again, the conversion is very important. So this particular product um, does support thyroid health and helps, you know, the function of the thyroid gland, it will help in terms of the conversion of T4 to T3. And when we do that, we will play a positive role in terms of supporting energy levels, hormone imbalance, some of those signs and symptoms that we see with low thyroid function. So this product is more specific for hypo or low thyroid function, not hyperthyroid. And the recommendation, of course, work with your uh, healthcare provider is anywhere from two to four capsules per day. And just a few words in terms of easing uh, the menopause transition. So the term menopause means that you have not had a menstrual cycle for one year. Um, the 10 to 15 years leading up to menopause is known as the perimenopausal period. So here we can maybe start to see some changes uh, with respect to, you know, cycle regularity, hot flushes or flashes, vaginal dryness, changes in mood and sleep. So, um, you know, this can start happening late 30s, early 40s for some women. And, you know, perimenopausal period and the menopausal period can bring, again, some of those unwanted symptoms that we are, you know, can be very difficult to deal with and can definitely impact our day. So again, the hot flashes, the vaginal dryness, difficulties with sleep, changes in mood, um, et cetera. So what do we see taking place here? You know, that um, change in hormonal levels such as our estrogen. So I talked uh, previously about the ovaries being the main endocrine gland that produces, um, you know, estrogen but that production does decline um, when we get into this transition stage. Uh, there's also decline in progesterone and testosterone. This can all impact our, um, you know, the different signs and symptoms that we might experience. Once the ovaries start to decline in terms of their ability to produce estrogen, then the adrenals kind of become the primary hormone source. Um, 
And as you can imagine, um, that's sort of another job for the adrenals to take on if they're already sort of struggling because of long term stress, um, then, you know, their ability to then support during the perimenopausal and menopausal stage won't, you know, won't be that great. So if they're already exhausted, they won't be able to produce the hormones that are needed during this stage. So we want to make sure that we're supporting adrenals. Um, and, you know, a really important question, is it menopause or is it the thyroid? Um, so many symptoms of low thyroid can actually um, be similar to menopause. Um, and, you know, a lot of women are just told, oh, you're, you're, going into perimenopause, you know, so this is something that you need to deal with. But that may not be the case. Okay, so always assessing and making sure that you know, your thyroid is being assessed properly is really, really important. So here in the peri perimenopausal period, um, keep in mind all those um, important uh, factors that we talked about in terms of supporting your diet, making sure you have enough protein. So the goal is generally about 1.2 to 1.5 grams uh, per kilogram of body weight uh, per day. So this will give you a rough estimate in terms of how much protein you need each day. And I if you're not used to eating protein, then definitely, you know, just really start gradually. A good rule of thumb is just to make sure you're having a source of protein at each meal and snack. Um, fiber, so making sure you're getting about 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day. Um, a nice sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of therapy to kind of incorporate is something called uh, seed and oil cycling. So oftentimes during uh, perimenopause, menopause, our cycles are irregular. Um, so actually, balancing our omega-3 fatty acids uh, for sort of the first half of the cycle, or if you don't have a cycle, it's difficult to determine. Sometimes the moon cycle is used as guidance. Um, so two weeks with omega-3 is followed by two weeks of omega-6, specifically um, GLA, which we can get from evening primrose oil or borage oil in that second half of the cycle. So that's another way to kind of support hormones during this stage. Reducing your overall um, toxic load exposure. So what I talked about before when we talked about supporting the ovaries. So really looking at changing your personal care products, household cleaning products, and um, some of the foods that you're eating. So to help reduce um, any pesticide consumption. If you're a smoker, you know, really try to quit smoking and avoid secondhand smoke, minimizing your intake of coffee and refined carbs and alcohol, engaging in physical movement, managing your perception of stress and engaging in uh, restorative sleep. Um, so again, really understanding the importance of this relationship between the adrenals, ovaries and thyroid gland is very, very important. Um, so I just wanted to kind of conclude with this quote from Dr. Michael Lamb. So all three organs uh, of this axis must be in a state of optimum balance, like a three legged stool, all three legs must be in perfect balance for the stool to be safe to sit on. Um, so I think that sort of illustrates just the importance of, you know, paying attention to all three areas. Now, do you need to do that all at the same time? No, uh, I know this can be, um, you know, a little bit more um, of work in terms of really trying to determine what area you need. So that's why it's really important if you're not sure to work with a naturopathic doctor or someone else who is knowledgeable in this area, they can really definitely provide some guidance in terms of where you should start and what areas um, really need the most support. So just a few words before I get to the Q&A. So uh, some of the products that I talked about from the Women's Sense line, um, helpful in terms of supporting the oat access. Women's Self, Women's Sense uh, is a actually a proud supporter of the Canadian Women's Foundation. The Canadian Women's Foundation is a national leader in the movement for gender equality in Canada. 
they, you know, play a very, very important role in terms of supporting programs that are needed for women and girls and gender diverse people to move out of violence, out of poverty, and into uh, areas of confidence and leadership. So the um, sale of each Women's Sense uh, bonus bottle, um, so $5 from the sale of each Women's Sense bonus bottle is actually donated to the Canadian Women's Foundation. So very, very important cause that Women's Sense supports. And just a few words on quality of products. So very important that you are looking at uh, the products that you're taking and how they are being tested. Um, so all of the products that I discussed um, in this education session are iSura certified. So iSura is a third party testing. They test for over 800 contaminants, really looking to support the production of pure and potent products. So anything that is iSura certified um, is non-GMO compliant, contaminant free, adulterant free, uh, authenticated and accurately labeled. And if you're interested in learning more about iSura, please go to iSura.ca. So thank you for your time. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to, you know, reach out to Women's Sense. Uh, you can follow Women's Sense on Instagram, Facebook, or go to their website. And if you do have any, you know, specific personal health questions, then definitely reach out to your healthcare provider for more information. So thank you for joining us tonight for this um, topic in terms of hormone balance and improving energy, mood, and sleep.